Okay, great. I see it's a couple of minutes past the hour. So Ryan, you think we're good to get started? Uh, I think so. Thank you all so much for being here. My name is Emily. I use pronouns she and her. I uh, come here from the board of the Green Burial Council. I'm on the 501c6 board. I also am the owner operator of Colorado Burial Preserve Natural Burial Grounds in Southern Colorado. And before that, I was a licensed funeral director, funeral home manager. So the Green Burial Council is actually two organizations. As I mentioned, we have the 501c6, which is a professional organization for funeral homes, cemeteries, and green burial product providers. We offer a voluntary credential and also um, industry networking, advocacy, and community. Uh, the 501c3 portion of Green Burial Council is more of a traditional nonprofit. Uh, the focus is more about uh, advocacy for green burial, knowledge, education about green burial among the public and among the consumer demand uh, in our industry. So the peer-to-peer -peer forum really represents a, a, you know, a marriage of these two aims of GBC. Uh, obviously, when we say peers, it's a, um, you know, we're inviting folks that are uh, industry, funeral homes, cemetery, uh, death workers, et cetera. Uh, our events are open to the general public, but we like to acknowledge that uh, the work that these types of folks do, it's not easy. We don't always have a whole lot of support from, from folks who don't work in death care. Uh, so there's value to coming together and work and uh, uh, having a forum, hosting a space uh, where we can talk about what it is to, to do this work. Uh, so the topic for tonight's peer-to-peer -peer forum is connecting the community to the cemetery. Uh, and I love this one. Uh, I think it's it's right in line with that mission of um, promoting green burial among the general population, because I feel that when uh, I feel that consumer demand for our products is what's going to drive our uh, standing in, in the greater uh, realm of responses to death. And when we can talk about our work and uh, invite folks to learn about our work on some day other than their worst day, other than the burial day, I think it does a lot of good for, for the whole industry of, of greener death care and uh, natural death and alternative responses to death in the industry. So the format we're gonna to use tonight, we have three guests, which I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, we will hear from each of them briefly. It's two cemeteries and a community group that might uh, access the cemetery to kind of flip it on the other way around. So we're gonna keep all the uh, participants on mute just during the initial presentations from our guests. You would be more than welcome to drop your questions in the chat because we will uh, reserve plenty of time at the end to take folks off of mute. We'll visit the questions from the chat and any other questions that might come up along the way uh, to save some time to do that, uh, uh, the peer to peer part of the forum, the, the connection time. <clears throat> I wanted to also mention that uh, the peer-to-peer -peer forum is meant to be a periodical event. We do them a few times a year. So uh, there's always an option to target what topic we might pick for the next one based on what the folks who uh, take the time to join us today and share their thoughts uh, or questions would like to see from a future peer-to-peer -peer, um, session. So I'll put my email in the uh, chat. We would love to hear about uh, anything about your questions for tonight's session and or any uh, questions or feedback for uh, future sessions. Our guests tonight are going to be Laura from <clears throat> Penn Forest Natural Burial Park in Pennsylvania. We have Brittany joining us from Friends of Laurel Hill Cemeteries, which is in Pennsylvania as well. And we have Veronica who founded Outside Rights, which is an ecotherapy and end of life care uh, resource for families. So without further ado, Laura, we have you up first. Let's see if we can um, get you focused here as the host and let's take it away. Okay, thank you. I'm going to share my screen real quick. All right, 
So I am Laura Fessel. I am the manager at Penn Forest Natural Burial Park, which is located in Verona, Pennsylvania, which is a bit northeast of Pittsburgh. So Penn, at Penn Forest, we have 35 acres of land, most of which is wooded. Five uh, burial areas are currently open for burial right now. We have a 10 acre wildlife preserve and there is a local uh, wildlife rescue center that will sometimes release animals onto the wildlife preserve. And then we have an open meadow area where a lot of our events happen. So our events, uh, the communities that we target are our Penn Forest community, the local communities surrounding us, the greater Pittsburgh community, uh, Western Pennsylvania and beyond. Our events are open to anyone in these communities who would like to attend them. And we get the word out through our quarterly newsletter, our website, our Facebook page, flyers, and um, of course, word of mouth. So to start with, I wanted to talk about an important aspect of engaging the community. And this is uh, to make friends with people in the know in your community. And by doing so, finding unexpected areas of support. And an example of that for us is when Pete and Nancy were starting the cemetery, they worked closely with the local planning department and in particular, um, a fellow there named Howard Davidson. Howard loved what they were doing and told Pete and Nancy to come up with a long range master plan and he would approve the whole thing before he retired. So they did, and he did. Um, and, and his approval of this plan gives us the security and the knowledge that we can create the future that we want for Penn Forest. And in doing so, guaranteeing community engagement well into the future. Um, I would like to talk about some things that we have in existence at Penn Forest that draws people in on most days. We have a hiking trail. Um, this trail was uh, built by a local Boy Scout for his Eagle Scout project. Uh, this picture on the left here is the ded dedication of the hiking trail, and it was um, dedicated to the memory or to the uh, in the honor of the Boy Scouts friend who had died whenever they were children. Um, the picture on the right is the Boy Scout. And then these are two more pictures of our hiking trail. The picture on the left is near our Grove B burial area. And then the picture on the right is our hiking trail in the fall. It's a really lovely walk through the woods. It's about two thirds of a mile long if you do our, our big loop. Um, but there are some smaller loops too if people didn't wanna do quite that much. We have a native grasses and wildflowers meadow. This was installed by a local landscape architect um, named Kathy Rayborn. She took a uh, course learning how to create native meadows. And then she approached us about installing one on our property. And this is in our meadow burial area. It's about a quarter of an acre in size. And it's really beautiful in the summertime whenever it's blooming and the insects love it. We also have a flower picking garden. And this garden is open to anybody who visits the cemetery. Uh, they're welcome to pick flowers anytime that they're blooming and they can use them for burials, to lay on graves or just to take home if they want. And last year we um, created an addition to the cemetery, uh, or I'm sorry, to the flower picking garden, which was um, our herb garden. It's a sensory herb garden and people can go in there and just kind of be with the herbs, smell them, feel them, taste them if they want to, take some home. We also have a farm at the property. It's called Returning Home Farm. And we currently have sheep, goats, ducks, and a donkey at the farm. And the animals just kind of hang out at the farm and visit with folks um, sometimes after tours or after burials. And especially after burials, people find this to be a really uplifting experience. People love the animals. Um, and our shepherdess, she will, uh, she'll breed some of the animals as well. So these are two of the sheep at the farm. 
This is our guard donkey, Jingles. And then this is feeding time for um, two of the babies at the farm, Elsa and Muskrat. And then you can also see uh, some of the Nigerian dwarf goats that we have in the left and two of our ducks on the right. And shortly after the, the farm was um, created, a local blacksmith, uh, black, blacksmither came and uh, set up shop in one of the buildings on the farm. And he taught blacksmithing classes out of the that building. He's not there anymore, but he did it for a little while. Uh, we have a few social distancing areas on the property. We put these in during COVID uh, because we wanted people to have a safe space to gather. We have a remembrance wall and it was built by uh, a, a local journalist from the Post Gazette who came and did a story on us and decided that he liked us so much and wanted to do a project at the cemetery. So he built this wall and then there's a box near the wall uh, filled with rice paper and pencils so you can write notes and stick them in the cracks of the wall. We also have a 40 foot labyrinth. It's a, ca a canvas la labyrinth, so it's not all it's not out permanently. We fold it up and uh, store it away and bring it out for certain events. We also lend it out to folks who have taken the labyrinth training course and want to use it for other events in their communities. And this is a very recent addition uh, to the property. This is our meditation hut. It was actually just finished this week. And it's a place for anybody uh, to use to go and meditate, to just go there and relax, maybe do yoga, whatever they wanna do. So now I'll talk about some events it, that we've had at Penn Forest. The first one here is a, our a barn warming event. And this was Back in 2016, right after the barn was built, there was about 100 people or so at this event. Um, I think that the target audience was largely Penn Forest folks, um, volunteers, workers, and their families, lot owners. And so there were um, activities, food and drinks. Uh, you, could, you could play with the baby goats if you wanted to, go on tours of the cemetery. In pre-COVID, uh, Penn Forest used to have an annual picnic every year. They had about nine of them, I believe, before COVID hit. And this was open up uh, to, our, to our local communities, Penn Forest community. Um, we would get about 100 to 150 people. There would be food and drink, live music, um, cemetery tours, goat races over at the farm. <laughs> they were fun events. We also do yoga with goats. And this is done over at the farm with our Nigerian dwarf goats because they're smaller. Uh, they set up in the paddock, bring the goats out. They kind of just walk around. They look for treats at your mat. They might like come over, to, like get in your face to get some pets. Um, sometimes they'll nibble on your clothing. It's a much more relaxed and kind of fun atmosphere for a yoga class compared to the traditional yoga. And then this is our yoga with goats staff. So they've done tree identification walks in the past. Uh, they also pre-COVID uh, did memorial tree planting events every fall. Uh, the picture on the left there is uh, the, the gentleman on the left is Pete McQuillan, who's one of the co-founders of the cemetery. Uh, Kathy Rayborn, who installed our native meadow, is in the middle. And she is talking about uh, the proper planting of trees. And then um, the gentleman on the right is Jeff Hodes, who is, he's our vice president of the cemetery, and he's a cemetery consultant. And I believe he's on the board of the Green Burial Council as well. And then the picture on the right is uh, a couple of people who had just finished planting a tree. So we, we do nature walk and talks currently. Our first one for this year will be actually this Saturday. 
Um, and they are led by a local naturalist. His name is Scott Hill, and he does really great job um, leading these events. And they're mostly through the woods on our hiking trail. And he, al he always comes up with a focus for each walk and talk. So it could be something to do with smell or early risers for like, you know, the, the flowers that come out early in the springtime, which that's the focus for Saturday's walk and talk. The past couple of years, we've had summer solstice events. Uh, the, the first year we had about 250 people attend the event. The second year was a bit smaller. There were only around 100 or so people, but they were really great fun events, uh, open to anybody, any, you know, we targeted all the communities that we could to get people into this, to these events. And it, it started off with a remembrance service for um, anybody who wanted to participate uh, that have lost a, a loved one in the past year. And afterwards, there was live music, drumming circles. We, would, we had our labyrinth out. There were activities like making flower crowns and painting kindness rocks, um, yoga classes. Uh, we had a local food truck and ice cream truck at the event. So this, uh, these pictures here are from the event this past summer. Um, the picture on the left, people wrote their wishes and intentions on a piece of paper and hung them on this line to fly in the wind. The picture on the right was get your picture with a chicken activity. <laughs> and then this was also at last summer's um, solstice event. And a local artist who's affiliated with Penn Forest had us create this memorial in, in memory of Pete who died earlier last year. So he got this special fabric that he put pictures on, pictures of Pete in the middle, surrounded by flowers and then our handprints um, on the outside. And you stay like that for about five minutes or so. And then the picture on the right is the after effect of of that, which turned out to be pretty cool. We've also done winter solstice events for the past four years or so now. And the winter solstice event is a bit different than the summer. It's a bit smaller, usually like, depending on the year, 60 to 100 people. Um, and as everybody arrives, they would be handed a stone that they could write their a name of a deceased loved one on. They would be given a piece of paper that they can write their wishes and intentions for the new year. And then they were also given a candle, a lit, a lit candle. And then they were instructed to walk a luminary path, which ended at the bonfire, which you see on the left there. Um, once everybody was gathered around the bonfire, um, a local officiant led a remembrance slash solstice service around the fire. And it had, um, crowd participation aspects to it. Uh, afterwards, there was live music and food and drink. It was really, really lovely events. And then we don't just engage the community at Penn Forest. We also go out um, to the local communities as well. Uh, this is a picture of Nancy and some friends tabling at a pride celebration a few years ago. This is me and Maria, my assistant manager, and then our mascot Jasper, who, um, who we bring to all of our tabling events, um, draws people in, especially kids, and we let everybody take their picture with them if they want. But this was us at a night market event uh, just down the hill from us in Oakmont, one of our local communities. So this was a leasing land workshop that Nancy spoke at recently. Uh, so she was asked to speak at this um, workshop because we lease some of our land to local farmers and they grow organic produce, which is sold at local farmers markets and um, local restaurants. And the gentleman standing up on the left there with his green hat. He is one of the owners of the, uh, the farm that we lease to. 
And the name of their farm is called Cold Co Farm. And these are some pictures of the farm. And the dog is Pickles. This is us. Uh, the past couple of years, we tabled at the fall festival event in Oakmont, which was a, a fun event near Halloween time. So you can dress up if you want. Um, they do like a Halloween parade and everybody hands out candy to the kids. Um, of course, we bring Jasper, our mascot, and, and we bring our coffin to this event usually because people love to get their pictures taken in it. And a couple of times we've tabled at a uh, haunted museum event at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh. Um, the, they do after hours events once a month and this is the one near um, Halloween time. Uh, so we get dressed up and of course take Jasper in the coffin to that, that event as well. So we've recently started doing um, green burial lunch and learns at the cemetery. And these are led by a local funeral director who does natural burial with us. And um, she's doing these monthly at the cemetery. Um, she's you know, educating people on green burial, giving a tour of Penn Forest and providing lunch for these events. And then another way that we engage with um, people in, in, in other communities is we get a lot of folks contacting us about uh, who want to start a green cemetery. And so they want to pick our brains, talk with us, see what we've done, you know, learn, you know, the steps that we, we took to become a green cemetery. And we try to get people to come to Penn Forest to talk with us for these um, uh, you know, it's just so that they can see what we've done. We're also happy to talk to them over the phone or through Zoom if that's easier, but we, we do try to get them to come out. And then some upcoming events. Um, this, uh, this is a picture of Carrie who tends to our um, herb garden. She is hosting a mindful tea sip class in June. And so the class is going to be about getting to know a garden herb through tuning into your senses and yourself. And it will be a time to practice mindfulness and connecting to plants. So um, she's going to brew some tea with some of the herbs that she dried from the garden last year. Uh, and then everybody will drink it, talk about um, their experience, and everybody will go home with a bag of herbs as well. This year, we are also having an office warming party. Um, the wooden cottage there that you see, uh, it has recently been restored. It was in the process of being restored for about two years. And we decided to move our offices into this building and the the wood on the building, a lot of it came from the original structure that was there, um, reused. And then a lot of the other wood, uh, it came from trees on our property. And it's a really lovely space, so we're gonna show it off this year. And there will be food and drink, of course, live music, hopefully dancing, um, I'm sure cemetery tours, maybe some activities as well, maybe some yoga. And then this fall, we are doing a remembrance tree planting for Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Day. This is something that we actually wanted to do in 2020, but because of COVID, we weren't able to do it. So we're finally to the point where we can do this event. Um, so we're gonna plant a flowering dogwood, which is the tree that's pictured here. And the idea is any anybody who, has experienced pregnancy and infant loss can come and hang like a swatch of clothing or blanket or booties on the tree on the tree and just kind of have like a sacred space. Um, this tree is being planted near our meditation hut. <clears throat> and we are also going to be building big gardens all around this tree um, in the future for people to just come and enjoy. And then 
The other way that we engage the community is through presentations. We do a lot of presentations and these are some of the, um, the places that I could think of just off the top of my head where we've done presentations, um, Green Burial Council, Phipps Conservatory in Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh Institute of Mortuary Science, and they also um, actually bring students out every year to tour our cemetery. Uh, Penn West University, Green Burial Association of Maryland. We do local libraries. Uh, BNY Mellon was a recent presentation that we did. We uh, have done presentations at local nursing homes and assisted living facilities, local churches, the Pittsburgh Free Thought community. Beachwood Nature Preserve, and then various networking groups. And I'm sure there are others. We've, um, we've done a lot. <laughs> and then that is my contact information for anybody who has further questions or want, want to discuss some things that they saw today. I would be happy to talk with you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you, Laura. <clears throat> that was great. I scribbled down a couple of ideas. <laughs> Excellent. And, uh, <clears throat> if I had known, I would have sent a Zoom invite to Jasper too. We could have had him on the call. <laughs> I mean, he must be busy. You guys have a lot on the calendar. <laughs> we do, we do. <laughs> thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you. Our uh, next presenter tonight will be Brittany from Friends of Laurel Hill, which sounds like it's two cemeteries. So I'm sure she'll tell us all about that. We'll get the... Uh, Post changed here and okay, Brittany, I think you're good to go. Great. Thank you so much, Emily. Laura, I feel I'm also like scribbling things down. That was just incredible. I really want to come for a visit now. I think you have so many beautiful things going on. Thank you. You should, you're welcome anytime. Definitely come. Thank you for sharing everything. Um, I, yeah, I will jump in and share um, the presentation that I have here. Let me just figure out how to get into um, full screen so you don't have to look at my whole, um, yeah, there we go. Um, my name is Brittany Sterner. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the public programs manager for the Friends of Laurel Hill, um, which is a um, nonprofit that supports two sister cemeteries. Um, we are located in Philadelphia, um, as well as Bella Kinwood. So this is a neighborhood or a, a um, township that's right across the Schuylkill River from Philadelphia. Um, Laurel Hill East was the first historic cemetery that was founded in 1836. Um, it was, I think, the second. I'm still learning all my facts. I'm I'm relatively new to Laurel Hill. I started um, last summer after leaving the public library system in Philly. I was there for a long time, um, which is also part of what I'll talk a little bit about. I, I um, as programs manager, end up kind of treating the cemetery as a public library. I can't really help it. Um, but uh, so, uh, yeah, I think Laurel Hill was the second um, rural cemetery in the country. It's now a designated national historic site. Um, and then um, some a couple of decades later in 1869, they expanded across the river into Bala Kinwood and founded Laurel Hill West, which is now an accredited arboretum. Um, and over at West, we also have a cemetery company, a funeral home, as well as our green burial site, Nature Sanctuary. And then we have um, a different kind of green burial site at East called Valley View. Um, and the Friends is a 501c3 nonprofit. So it's separate from the cemetery company, the funeral home. Um, and we exist primarily to engage the public, um, to provide education, to raise funds, to steward the historic cemeteries. Um, they have a long and interesting history. If you ever want to read about them, I'm really happy to share resources. Um, but basically, Laurel Hill East fell into degradation until the 70s, um, and a lot of the grave markers were buried. Um, and this was, you know, kind of wild because there's some of the most notable people to have ever lived and shaped Philadelphia are buried at Laurel Hill. Um, so part of our mission when we were founded um, in 1978 was to help preserve the cemeteries. Um, just kind of breaking out um, briefly, we seek to engage everybody, <laughs> the general public, um, of really focusing on the neighborhoods that are directly around um, Laurel Hill, particularly Laurel Hill East. 
Um, Bella Kinwood is a bit more of a kind of suburban neighborhood um, and a lot of people, you know, stroll and use it there. But um, we have neighborhoods around Laurel Hill East that historically don't use the cemetery as much. And so we're really focusing on trying to um, engage our immediate neighborhoods. Um, we also um, do a lot of outreach to students, um, whether they're younger students, um, whether it's a preschool tour, or today we had Temple University students um, who were sketching uh, botanical prints and memento uh, flowers and memento mori. Um, and so we work with college students as well. Um, we get a lot of birders and gardeners. Um, and of course, people who are um, through our death awareness programming, we're really seeking to engage folks who may be actively grieving or experiencing loss, um, which grief we treat in through programming in a very, very loose, broad sense. It doesn't necessarily mean um, death, um, but this experience of grief that is so um, threaded throughout life. Um, and of course, we also try to engage in really meaningful ways people who have loved ones buried at the cemetery. We have um, Laurel Hill East doesn't have a whole lot of active burials. In fact, I would say we have more weddings than burials. Um, people love to get married at Laurel Hill East, um, but Laurel Hill West is a very active um, burial space and death care space. And so that's something that we really have to take into consideration when we do programs is not um, interfering in any way with services that are happening. Um, and so being, you know, very, very connected about the schedule and being able to pivot and, and have it in different areas of the cemetery. Um, but then also seeking ways, especially through folks who have family members buried at Nature Sanctuary, um, to engage families um, who have loved ones buried there. Um, I won't go through all the marketing stuff, but just to say that the primary focus is on partnership. So a lot of the programs that we do aren't just presented by Laurel Hill. We really seek, especially when we're talking about um, historical programs or um, I guess, I don't know how to summarize it, but um, when we're talking about permanent residents um, and telling their stories and legacies and how they relate to larger public life and cultural life, we really try to work with people who have lived experience in that area. Um, so we just did um, something called um, Flowers for the Philly Sound, honoring the birthday of Teddy Pendergrass and other soul musicians who were buried at Laurel Hill West. So we brought in folks who were a big part of the scene, the soul scene in Philly in the 70s, and who are a big part of the music scene. Um, and they led a kind of community panel about the impact of the Philly Sound. And then um, we gave out roses. So everyone and a map and everyone was able to walk to the grave sites and kind of have a mo moment of silence. Um, but at any rate, we really try to focus on partnerships, whether it's through the presenter of the program, um, community orgs that we're working with, um, and or school partnerships. And that's not just for um, marketing. That's that's very much about the quality and meaning of the program. Um, through doing our public programs, we really try to invite life into the cemetery and kind of re-socialize it. Since we're a Victorian cemetery, we focus a lot on the fact that in rural cemeteries, people used to picnic um, and it was very common to promenade and, and take your lunch and see your friends. And so we really try to um, bring that idea back to life and re-socialize hanging out in the cemetery while also being really critical of the fact that um, that was something that a wealthy, you know, the wealthy class was able to participate in and a lot of other folks weren't. And so um, we actually have an upcoming drag show for all, all ages of family drag show with the Bearded Ladies Cabaret, which is a very established cabaret in Philly. And they're having a Victorian picnic um, where they invite people to um, kids of all ages come and learn about, you know, what is a Victorian and why are we picnicking, picnicking here and could everybody be buried here and just kind of asking these more critical questions in a gentle way while having tea and cake. Um, we also try to use the space as a non-traditional performance venue. So we are a hub for the Fringe Festival this year. 
um, and working with different experimental performance artists. Um, we do immersive theater um, and really try to invite artists into the space to work with it, to create site-specific works. Nothing to the scale of um, Greenwood. We're not um, at that funding level yet, um, but uh, really just trying to have people be in creative relationship with the space, with its art and architecture and history and all of the stories that are held within it. Um, we also try to, um, we do a lot of, um, again, history-based tours, um, local and national, and we're really trying to move into a space of community dialogue and reflection around death awareness, whether that's preparing something practical for end-of-life planning or, um, you know, focused in more of a creative and reflective sense or working with grief. Um, these are just some of the programs that are recent or upcoming. Um, Last night, we had an event with author Lorraine Carey, who wrote a book about um, uh, caring for her grandmother in the 101st year of her life. If you haven't read it, it's a really wonderful book. It's called Lady Sitting. She's a Philadelphia author. We do the death cafes. Um, we have a living will clinic coming up with Death Doula's Sunset Companion. So everyone will kind of um, be gently guided through this process of um you know, asking a series of questions that go into creating a living will um, and making it a bit more of a, not necessarily a fun experience, but something that we're encouraging people at a younger age to really start to think about as a normal thing. Um, we do a lot of outdoor, obviously, programs. Um, this weekend, we have a beekeeping workshop at our apiary, and we'll be making um, hand-rolled um, honeycomb taper candles afterwards and sampling some of the honey, um, guided birding walks. And uh, we also have a friends group, um, members that support um, the friends, and they have some members-only programs, and they have a cocktail workshop coming up where it's using um, press flowers in the simple syrup. Um, I just put together a few um, images. This top one is from the market of the macabre that we do. I think I, I'm personally trying to figure out how we get out of this like very um, locked in identity that we've had for a long time is that we're very like creepy and eerie. And I think it's because we have all of these great like Victorian structures and we do this market of the macabre where every year where 3000 people come, we have about 65 vendors. Most of them are witches or occult or, um, and, and I love this crowd. I, I'm, I identify as part of it, but <laughs> um, I think it's hard when you have this like very historic ornate foreboding site and we've really played into a lot of the um you know like we'll show horror films that are outdoor movie series but we're also trying to do grief programming um which is also why I re just really love the balance of of programs that Laura was describing and um want to kind of try to figure out how we can move in that direction while still like giving people the macabre that they um have come to know us for um yeah, this is, uh, we usually do fire pits in the fall with cider when we do our soul crawl walks. Um, so this is just kind of something from our courtyard. Um, indoor programs, family programs, birding. Um, we do gardening days at Nature Sanctuary, which I talk, I'll talk about. We've done yoga. Um, uh, this bottom photo is from Shakespeare in the Cemetery program. We get a grant to invite middle and high school students to do a 10-week immersive course where they um, do a Shakespeare play. And then at the end, we have a community performance. It's led by a local theater company called Rev Theater. Um, and the kids love it. They're amazing. Um, we invite all their friends and family. It's a free public show. Um, and they just get to kind of like romp around the cemetery and use it as their stage. Um, I wanted to, uh oh, here we go. I wanted to talk a little bit about, because this is through Green Burial Council, Nature Sanctuary is our green burial site. Um, it is habitat for native plants and insects, um, as well as a garden um, where folks are really encouraged to come and spend time and hopefully take peace and comfort in the way that the environment is changing and is providing all of these really uh, mutual benefits um, to plants, to humans living and dead, to um, animals, you know, to everything. Um, and we are also starting to do more programming there as well. 
um, this is just kind of the, um, we have a really amazing horticulturist who was supposed to speak with me tonight, but unfortunately wasn't available, Greg Tepper. He um, stewards this with a team of horticulturists. Um, and this is just kind of to give you a sense of where it's headed. And it started out as a meadow and it's going to eventually be um, a forest. Um, this is just some pictures. This is Nature Sanctuary in the winter, I think shortly after it was created. Um, it's evolving over time. Again, a lot of native plants um, and a lot of herbal things that we use in different eco-mindful programs like bee balm and mint and um, just different things that have these kind of very, um, like Laura was saying, like sensory experiences. Um, we also do some um, gardening events. Oops, sorry. Um, with volunteer events where folks come and weed um, and there's some gardening education there and there are a lot of um, people who participate in these volunteer events who have buried a loved one there and I think um, I wish that Greg was here to share more about that because I haven't been to one of these events but I know that um, they seem to be the feedback that we've gotten about that experience is that it's been very very healing for people to be able to garden with others and see the meadow kind of change um, at the gravesite. Um, we recently did a virtual lecture um, with Greg Tepper and the co-founder of um, Friends of Green Burial PA, Karen Bonificino, and one of our funeral directors, Pat Quigley, really just kind of um, trying to educate folks. We get a lot of questions about, you know, what is green burial? And it's so interesting because we've forgotten it in the last like couple of generations when really it was used to be the only way, right? And it's just really interesting how people are so shocked. Like, what do you mean you don't have to have a concrete vault? And what do you mean that you don't, you know? And so we really sensed an interest in wanting to learn more about it. And so this was kind of about, this lecture broke out into, um, three pieces. First, we talked about nature sanctuary and what physically is going on, what happens to the body in a green burial um, and what the habitat is and where it's going. Um, and then we talked about the history and advocacy and movement work for green burial recently in Pennsylvania. Um, and of course, got into composting and everything that's you know been going on over the last year or so legally. Um, and then also talked about um, with the funeral director um, and Karen, who's also a death doula, um, the experience for the family of doing a green burial and ways that it can help with the grieving process. Um, upcoming, we have a fragrant plants and Tussie Mussies workshop. We always draw on our Victorian heritage. Tussie Mussies are the little nosegays that you would wear so that you wouldn't smell other folks because baths weren't so common um, and they were pretty. Um, and so we have a horticulturist who's been doing things at local arboretums who's going to come and lead folks through Nature Sanctuary to forage and learn about some of the fragrant plants that we have. Um, and then um, turn them into tiny little arrangements that they can take home. So it's a little bit of education, it's a little bit of art, it's a little bit of outdoor um, uh, piece. Um, this summer, we are starting a new um, series called Nurture with Nature with a local horticulturist and mixed media artist, Kate Irvine. Um, I love her quote about it. The idea is to look at plants that are both alive and in decay and to consider how they might relate back to your own emotional state. It's about exploring, getting out of your head and making choices to create and connect. This is a time to get outside and sharpen your own regrowth, not to let life pass you by. And I think that's just so beautiful and something that is really nice to offer in a place like Philadelphia, where um, despite uh, having the most parks of any major urban area in the country, um, a lot of folks, because of redlining, because of um, economic oppression, because of racism, um, don't have access to green spaces. And so something that we're really trying to do is create more accessible opportunities to just like be like relax in a, a in a natural space. Um, they're ninety minute sessions. We're doing one a month for four months. Um, they're on a sliding scale. They're, they're open to everyone. No one's turned away for lack of funds. Um, and it's again, she's not a therapist. She has a certificate in hort therapeutic horticulture, which is different from 
a horticulture therapist. Um, and so we try to be very clear, you know, about that. And with, when we do stuff like death cafes, it's like, we're not counselors, you know, these are more like creative tools, mindfulness tools. Um, well, similar to the fragrant plants, harvest things out of nature sanctuary, um, arrangements, botanical prints, um, votive crafting with pressed flowers. Um, we'll do a little bit of light weeding and gardening, learning to identify some plants, um, forest bathing, journaling, creative things, writing letters to loved ones and ourselves, um, and drinking herbal teas with herbs from the garden. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know how this will go. I hope that people come. <laughs> um, and I'm, I think I'm most excited about, about that one. Um, yeah, this is my contact info. You can find our programs at that link or find us on, um, Instagram or Facebook at friends of Laurel Hill. Um, and I'm here if you, yeah, have any questions. Thank you for letting me share. It's really great to just be here and hear what other people are, are doing. It's really exciting. So thank you. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Brittany. It is, it is awesome to hear about this. I love that last thing about therapeutic horticulture. I really, for me, that's like one of the promises of natural burial. It's like, firstly, the loved one, the body can go back to the earth, but what does that mean? There's like uh, something growing. And then to be able to have the folks in the garden participating in that, <clears throat> that's perfect. But I also feel like in our natural, in our cemetery spaces, uh, it's greener if we use them for more waste. Like it's good that we're responding to deaths, but when we have guests in for a concert and then we have guests in for a party, it's like, wow, this facility is being used in, in multiple different ways. And to add the uh, access to nature for disadvantaged populations for me has always been an important part of that same story. It's like, we have this beautiful outdoor space Anyone who needs or wants that should come and take advantage of it and not wait till there's been a death because it's here all four seasons. So anyway, thank you very much for sharing all of that. <clears throat> um, our next speaker is going to be Veronica Wiley with Outside Rights. Veronica, let's get you focused. Looks like you might be on mute. Now you're good. Okay. Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. All right. Um, hi, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this uh, presentation. My name is Veronica. I go by V and my pronouns are they, them. I am located in the Denver, Colorado area, and I'm not particularly affiliated with any one green burial space. Uh, I am a community member who is really passionate about uh, getting people involved in uh, the death positive movement, conscious dying. I am a death doula. I have been a yoga teacher for over a decade. I am also a nature therapy facilitator. Um, so uh, that same distinction of I am not actually a licensed therapist, but trained in therapeutic techniques um, and making that really clear with the folks that I work with. And I also have a master's of business administration focused on the outdoor industry. And part of what really inspired uh, my work in the way that I combine all of these things together was a qualitative study from Alberta in the, their palliative grief parks project, if any of you are familiar with that, where they really focused on the uh, connection that nature plays in helping to process grief in providing physical, emotional, spiritual comfort at the end of life. And so there's a few different ways that I work with people, with families, individuals, as well as groups um, to really utilize nature and especially cemeteries to um, just assist in that, in that process. Um, so with uh, outside rights, I work with uh, families and individuals who are going through the end of life stage and people who want to either be in nature or as close to nature as possible uh, during, during their end of life. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that that can look. I know Emily and I have talked um, a little bit about, um, you know, how that can look just bringing death care, bringing end of life care into uh, cemetery spaces. And then I also work with people um, after a death has occurred and um, 
Like I have a client that I'm working with on Saturday who lost their husband uh, four months ago and they are very intentional about wanting a somatic kind of healing process and wanting to be out in nature. And when I posed the question to them, how do you feel about cemetery wandering? Um, the, the response was a little bit like, oh, I hadn't thought of that because while yes, it would be great if we could bring grief into public spaces. I think we even have a grief in public day coming up on the 23rd. Um, it would be, it would be beautiful if, you know, our normal kind of suburban and urban parks, uh, felt a little bit more open to those complex emotions. We have cemetery spaces that are outdoors, that are in nature and really create a great container for all of those other complex emotions other than let's go have a picnic. Um, and so that's something that really inspires me in working with people. And then the other thing that I do is I offer corpse pose yoga workshops uh, that are open to the general public, anybody who is interested in learning more about um, you know, the death positive movement, conscious dying, green burial, and holding space for all of that in a way that is educational, but also provides, again, that somatic experience, the physical breath and movement, um, but then also the focus on kind of this philosophical aspect within the yoga practice of to be in the practice of uh, you know this this corpse pose shavasana if you've ever taken a yoga class and your teacher has said corpse pose is the most important posture it it's true that's that's really where the philosophy of the practice comes in because this idea is that to be in the consistent practice of uh, confronting and contemplating and accepting your own mortality really changes the way that you approach your day-to-day -day life when you are off of the mat. And so being able to do that in all of the different um, amazing spaces that I have access to here in the Denver area uh, has, been, has been really great. So I'm still uh, putting together my calendar for uh, this coming season, but I'm really excited as always to partner with different uh, spaces and I'm even trying to work out how I could offer that uh, virtually and what that might look like. And that's not quite my three minute thesis record, but we'll, we'll go with it. Perfect, thank you. I just this week saw a uh, social media post and it was about the type of grief that can sometimes be anger right? The anger that comes with a, a loss. And one of the comments on this post said, you know, thank you so much for, for bringing up anger and grief. This is really landing with me. Uh, just the other day, I had to drive by a cemetery and I stopped and I, you know, screamed all my rage out. And, you know, I, I, then I cried. Now I feel so much better about my loss. And uh, who, whoever's account this was on came on and said, oh, I love how you brought that up. Um, you didn't say it's the cemetery where your loved one is buried. You said stop by a cemetery. <laughs> um, but you're absolutely right that there is, um, you know, a cemetery can be a space for grief. It can be a space for behavior that you wouldn't feel comfortable just doing at the mall or, uh, you know, even sometimes in a regular yoga studio or even a regular space for grief. Yeah. <laughs> neat, neat. <clears throat> Um, well, I wanted to repeat that uh, we have a little time here for questions. So if anyone uh, has a question for the GBC or for our guests, it's very much meant to be uh, your time and, um, you know, happy to, sh I can read them out of the chat or, or folks can uh, <clears throat> come on. Uh, I did have one to start with. We, we had asked on social media a couple of days ago, if anyone, um, you know, had any suggestions for questions for uh, this event. And one of them came in almost word for word, except the last two, the last phrase changed um, for something that I was going to, oh, I, I have my own question. So I'll get ready to ask it. So um, here's my question for any of you guys. Uh, and, and you can answer any version of this question. But when we start to talk about a cemetery as a mixed use space, um, sometimes there can be threats that come from the outside, like uh, environmental degradation, 
uh, security risks, or, um, you know, I think, Brittany, you spoke to this, but the mood can change, right? Is it a sacred space or is it a, a goth party? Uh, you know, sometimes that really matters depending on what um, audience we're working with. So uh, if any of you would like to speak to this uh, road we walk between opening the cemetery and protecting the cemetery. I can um, talk a little bit about that. I'm Rachel Essig. Um, I'm on the Green Burial Council board. Um, I'm also the executive director of Riverview Cemetery in Portland, Oregon. We're a historic 140 years old as of December, um, right in the heart of the city of Portland, adjacent to downtown. And this is something we deal with every day because people love to come to Riverview. Um, it's very rich in history, but it also is environmentally rich. We have five distinct habitats in that cemetery, and we are on an incredibly steep hill with paved roads, and uh, we allow bicyclists through our cemetery as safe passage. Um, but with that comes straddling the folks that are training. So they're like going really fast on their bikes um, and not really caring about the mourners or the purpose of the cemetery. And uh, it's something that I deal with like on a weekly basis where there's conflicts between um, people like working out in our cemetery with, and then people that are there for a reason and that's to do business with us. And then people just in their, you know, moms with their babies and strollers and you know, maybe the jogger, the, you know, group of walkers. Um, and so it's like, it's a difficult balance on how do you word that? What does your signage look like? Um, how do you inform the public and educate people? Um, and it's a really, really tough balance. I, I love it that we get so many visitors every year, but it is private property. Um, and, you know, I want the visitors, but I also um, need to keep the ground sacred and, uh, fulfill the purpose of the cemetery. Um, so it's an interesting balance to make. Um, and again, it comes down to like word choice. How do you, we actually came up with a, um, I hired a PR firm and we have like a little cartoon and a video that we run on our social media um, periodically to remind people how to respect the cemetery when they come in and visit. Thank you. You're absolutely right. It's just a difficult road. You have to be constantly reevaluating it. Um, that's kind of my answer to uh, Caroline from Digital and Stone asked, uh, is there a legal spacing between areas of mixed use and areas that are uh, burial ground? And the answer is, you know, it totally depends what state and jurisdiction you're in, what the laws are about cemetery. Uh, but in general, I would be pretty surprised to find a law about that. Um, because we have people's tastes that, <laughs> and people's preferences that really are going to police us on finding that comfort zone on, uh, you know, this is someone's active burial site. They were just buried. So, you know, I think everyone would agree that's kind of taboo. How many years have to pass before that site's a nothing and now we could toss a Frisbee? Uh, ooh, that's a, it's a tough one. It's going to really vary place to place and property to property and uh, type of burial to type of burial. So, a good question, but not a legal question. Um, <clears throat> uh, for Brittany and Laura, they, this was a question I had too. What does your staff or volunteer situation look like with all these events you're putting on? It sounds like a ton of work and uh, sounds like it's going well for you guys too. So tell us how you handle all that. So I can start. Um, our staff consists of me and Maria. <laughs> We're the only two actual employees at the cemetery. Um, and then there's um, Nancy, the owner, and we have some contractors and volunteers. Um, we really, really rely on volunteer help to put on a lot of the events. Um, it's especially like, you know, the walk, the, the walk and talks, um, the solstice events, we need multiple volunteers for um, just organizing the events, 
are like huge undertaking or can be huge undertakings like the summer solstice event especially um and then of course putting it on that day um we're there probably 12 hours that day working nonstop um just to make sure that event is pulled off um and, and we do we need a lot of volunteer help <laughs> Laura, I'm concerned for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're getting to the point where we could use another employee soon, maybe a part time employee or something, but <laughs> we could, we're starting to need a little more help. <laughs> amazing that you pull all of that off. That's really amazing. We, <laughs> um, we have five people. I'm, I'm the person who's at all of like consistently at all of the events. Um, but I have so much help from my colleagues. Um, so we have, um, an administrative assistant, a tours and volunteers manager, which is separate from public programs. Um, we have a development director and we have an executive director and we all show up for bigger events. So not for something smaller, like a workshop, but for say a cinema screening or the circus that we're putting together for the fall, all of us will be all, all hands on deck for that. Um, that's for public programs. We do so many tours though, and those are entirely volunteer led. We have, I think because Laurel Hill has such a long history and, and has vines that go into so much of Philadelphia history in so many different ways, it draws a lot of interest from different community scholars. And so we have a group of probably 80 volunteers who only lead tours. So we, we don't lead any of our tours. They do all of their own research. Um, we check it. <laughs> um, and that's a whole other process. Um, but we have long standing relationships with really amazing community scholars who really just want to give their time um, and have access to, you know, they come into our vault, they look in our lot folders, um, they do all their own research. And so um, we also have help from volunteers to do larger events as well. So we're really, really lucky to, yeah, it's very, very um, volunteer run, but I'm also lucky to have other colleagues who um, participate, you know, as events like above and beyond their, like, you know, it's other duties as assigned. Um, I, I wanted to comment too on your other question about just like mixed space. And, you know, we get reactions sometimes on Instagram that are like, or calls or emails that are like, how dare you do this in a cemetery, you know? Um, and I think one thing that is really easy for us to do because we are Victorian, it, it's a Victorian site, but I think others can as well, is that we really try to just draw on education of history and like public relationships with cemeteries um, prior to, you know, uh, 1900. Um, and really think about like, you know, Victorians are really great to draw and they loved being intertwined with death. And so it's, it's, it, it's helpful to kind of draw on that history and say, you know, um, that historically, this is part of culture, and it's, you know, cultures always shift over time. Um, and then we also uh, try to be very forward about the fact that a lot of people who bury their loved ones at Laurel Hill or want to be buried at Laurel Hill do so because they know it's going to be used often. And so, um, you know, along with that, and then also nodding to our permanent residents at the beginning of every event and having sort of a moment of reverence for them, we really try to um, handle it that way. That's perfect. I like that. I think you can get uh, a lot of value out of a simple acknowledgement uh, that buys you a little grace. And I think also, too, um, I always say about the folks who were already buried there, they had their day, <laughs> you know, they, they had the time when it was their special moment of their passing and their loved ones. And now it's time for something else. So, again, like you said, it's it's an acknowledging um, Erica has a question. She's challenging us to uh, share what type of intentional um, verbiage and actions and uh, communications uh, back up our commitments to diversity and, and social justice in our, our work with disadvantages, disadvantaged communities, communities of color. Um, I'll answer it for myself first. 
uh, Colorado Burial Preserve, we are a private company, so I don't have a board or a large staff at all. Uh, very hard to uh, increase diversity within a family business other than some other major changes. Um, but what I am working on is a educational facility that we could use to have a class or a yoga class or uh, for me, my goal since I founded the preserve has been field trips. Uh, because that's where I feel like, uh, especially kids who don't have access to nature, uh, something that uh, is a cause I found important. Um, but because I don't have that diversity baked into my organization, my strategy on that has always been to find the folks that are seated in the community doing that work and let them be the guides for what these programs uh, should look like, what the beneficiaries of their organizations need from, from my work and, and uh, my privileges. And uh, yeah, let the, let the community uh, guide, guide that important work. Does anyone else wanna take on that topic? I can speak toward that a little bit. I just wanna say thank you for that question, Eric. I really appreciate it. And um, echoing Veronica too, it's a constant learning process. and something that I'm thinking a lot about with Laurel Hill being new there, especially and coming from a very different setting in a public library. Um, transparently, Laurel Hill uh, has historically not been very interested in being transparent about its own history. It was actually segregated. Only white folks could be buried there until 1973, and they've never publicly addressed that fact. Um, and it, to me, it feels like a critical piece of information that if you're going to be talking about local history, you have to acknowledge your role in the oppressive systems and the, the kind of institution that you've historically been. Um, so that's a piece that I haven't figured out yet how to discuss in public programming um, in a meaningful way. Um, but I think, yeah, I think your questions are really good about how do you do this beyond partnerships and not really um, just kind of look to someone else to drive the content. I do think that partnerships are important when it comes to bringing lived experience into a, a dialogue. Um, I, you know, I don't know what it's like to be Black and walk into that cemetery and what it feels like. And so I've had a lot of conversations with historically Black organizations around Laurel Hill, like Johnson House Historic Site, um, which was actually, a, it was, the house was originally owned by a white family and it was a um, site on the Underground Railroad, but has now been under the direction. Um, it's 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 way more, it's very, very run very differently now and is under um, black leadership. And so we have in the past done a Juneteenth program at Laurel Hill because of the period of history that our cemetery falls into. Um, and I've been in a lot of conversations with the director of Johnson House Historic Site about, um, she also organizes the Juneteenth Festival in the neighborhood, but no one had ever reached out to her before. And that just felt kind of like a starting point of having this conversation and kind of coming to her in this place of trying to be accountable to the narratives that were perpetuating. Because we had an abolitionists tour that actually didn't have any abolitionists on it. And because the cemetery... Um, I don't mean to trash talk Laurel Hill at all, <laughs> but like, yeah, I gotta be honest, like it's complicated, you know, I'm like, what do we do with this place? Um, and the tour that we had didn't have abolitionists, nor did it have any folks of color because they weren't allowed to be buried there. So it's like, how do we talk about this holiday that has this Independence Day that has very much to do with the time period that we talk about um, in a way that is has meaning and and is you know it resonates um with people especially of folks who aren't white so that conversation is ongoing we're also i'm also talking to folks at eden cemetery which is a historically black cemetery near us um and just kind of really trying to think about our programming content so um i think that storytelling is so powerful and by holding and stewarding all these stories we have a huge responsibility to not mistell them to not undertell them to not erase stories to not tell parts of them um, to tell a full holistic accurate portrait and I think that takes a lot of voices which is why I think partnership comes up a lot um, but also paying people very like um, compensating people who decide that they want to partner with us um, 
very well for the the work that they're putting into it. Um, another piece is really trying to figure out more, you know, uh, Laurel Hill is located in Lenape Hoking. Um, everybody who's buried there is a colonizer. Um, sorry. Um, but really trying to work with more indigenous led groups and not just saying, oh, this is in Lenape Hoking and giving, a, you know, an empty land acknowledgement, but um, really thinking about what place and belonging mean when we have these like over 300 acres that are in our care um, and trying to work with, you know, the Lenape tribes that are still here and haven't been displaced with the indigenous arts groups um, of which there are a couple in Philly. Um, I feel like I'm rambling now, so I'm going to stop, but it's a lot of questions. Um, and I appreciate, I really appreciate that being asked. And I would love to hear um, your thoughts, Erica, or anybody else in the room who wants to to share. Um, I can speak a little bit about Riverview. Um, so this, the cemetery itself has always been integrated, um, which is interesting to me. Um, a lot of people might not know this, but Oregon um, is has a really bad history about uh, around white supremacy. And um, so it was interesting to me when I took over operations there that the cemetery has always been open to everyone and there's not sections or anything. It's very integrated, um, but the big but is the board of trustees of Riverview. Um, so when I started, so there's 12 trustees and 11 of them were um, white males older. And it always been like that. And the one person that didn't meet that category was the only female and the only person of color. And, um, and she's Chinese. And uh, when I started, she was like, and she'd been on the board for a while. And she's like, I'm so happy that you're, you're on board because we're gonna, um, diversify this board under your tenure, I need your help. And in the past few years, we've, um, we've added, um, we've, we were able to help transition some um, of the elder board members off um, politely, and then uh, recruit uh, people that, you know, look like our cemetery. So what we had didn't match what the cemetery looked like. We're, we're a membership cemetery, by the way. So when you buy an interment right at our cemetery, you become part owner of the cemetery. And the board of trustees represent those owners, but we, have the, we had this integrated cemetery with all races and religions and genders and a board of trustees that didn't represent the people at all. Um, so it's been an interesting thing to go through and try to explain all of this to people that are up on DEI at all and how to navigate that. And, and especially when it's a place where there's so much heritage, because I'm talking about board members that generationally have served, their dad served before them, and then their grandpa served before that. So to try to explain all of that um, and those concepts were but we're still doing it, it's not easy. But then even in, even within this industry, um, it's not very diverse. Like to find employees is very difficult to diversify. So what, what I've been doing is, so I'm lucky I have Mount Hood Community College right here in the Portland area and they have a mortuary program. And uh, so I work with the leader of that mortuary program and we open our doors to internships. And um, so I've been able to like make that DEI change um, on my staffing level where I just open it up and um, we mentor and bring people up in, into the industry that way. Yeah, I could just, oh, go ahead. No, you go. Um, so uh, thank you all uh, for the uh, information shared. Uh, I am actually working on a uh, project in uh, Durham. I'm a death doula, indigenous practitioner and priest. 
Uh, so I do a lot of work in the niche of, of spirituality and green natural burial um, access in the underserved communities. Uh, some things that I'll just put out there as nuggets uh, and you all can uh, get with me via email. I put my email in the chat, uh, but because I want everyone to be successful uh, in this, uh, some things that we have to consider is how our board looks. Uh, and the board uh, should have diverse um, thoughts, uh, connectivity to community, engagement, diversity, equity, and inclusion components as well. Uh, secondly, a mission statement that states what it is that you're actually trying to accomplish. Uh, if I, that's one thing that I'm looking for uh, when I start to look at cemeteries, is there a mission statement that makes me feel welcomed? Um, if, if we don't have that, then that's somewhere, that's somewhere to start, uh, is, is flat out saying, what is it that you are attempting to accomplish with your events and your programming? Uh, and then third, um, being intentional about looking for folks that are um, of color uh, that are in this space. There's not a lot of us, uh, but um, looking for people that are in this space to be a part of boards. Uh, for instance, I am now working with uh, Liz at Green Burial Council um, and in making sure that uh, my voice is a part of uh, what's happening, but I'm also down for other boards if if that if that thought needs to expand and and um, make sure that that you all have access to diversity and thought because that is incredibly important. If the real goal is to create space that uh, folks of color uh, would be interested in in coming to, um, we're doing some really amazing things in Durham. Um, in the project, I have a, a poetry ode to the ancestors um, event coming up in, in May, where I will then tag in the conversations with ancestral reverence and the simplicity and revolutionary act of having a simplistic funeral and talking about green natural burials. Um, there's going to be potential talks around uh, books that are in that subject. Um, and really finding those niche spaces that, that folks of color um, gravitate to. So uh, if you have any questions uh, or need insight, uh, please use uh, my email um, or if uh, you need to throw me on a board so I can uh, give you some thought. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Rachel, I don't know if you saw this one in the chat. I thought you might uh, be able to answer it since Riverview does conventional burials and green burials. Have you ever had problem with your staff being uncomfortable around the ideas of green burial? No, they took to it right away. Um, and and you know, this is before I started there, but um, so we've been doing uh, green burial since 2009. Um, and so a lot of my staff members are, are still the same from back in 2009. In fact, we just did a presentation to the Cemetery Association of Oregon. And, um, and I let my um, grounds maintenance crew give the presentation because that they were talking to other grounds maintenance from other cemeteries um, and just basically debunking myths about um, green burial and in uh, Riverview is unique. We don't have a segregated green burial section. Uh, we, you know, if the wife wants um, to, you know, be planted like a tree and green burial, you know, she's a tree hugger, loves that idea of going back to the earth, but the husband doesn't like the idea of being dirty and wants to go in a metal casket in a vault, they can be buried next to each other. Um, and uh, so it's a little bit more maintenance on our end, um, but my, um, my crew adapted to it um, pretty well and still do. Neat, neat. Yeah, but it was interesting talking to the other cemeteries, just the, the questions and the fear. Um, and even when we were presenting, I could see them shaking their heads. Um, but, um, you know, they, it's, it just takes, you know, doing it, just do one. And then once they get it under their belt, 
they'll see how easy it is. I was going to comment from your uh, story of the changes you've made in your organization, like, wow, it's amazing you made any changes at all, just because our industry, funeral and cemetery, is sort of notorious for being slow to change. Um, but mm -hmm. I think, well, two things are, are driving the change. Firstly, is consumer demand, people asking for this. But secondly, is just plain old information and education. So, uh, you know, the fact is there's not a risk to worker health for handling a, a biodegradable casket of an unembalmed person. And uh, there's not a huge safety difference between a, a burial with a vault and a burial without a vault in most cases. So mm -hmm. I think some of these uh, uh, recalcitrants against change can really just be fear of the unknown and simple here's a guy who did it before. He's still here. He's fine. Uh, he wasn't right, scared. Yeah. Uh, I think that could go a long way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, you know, this industry is super slow to change, super, super slow to change. Um, so I'm always excited whenever I see any form of change or concepts or ideas or adaptations. Um, you need to look at cremation. Uh, you know, years ago, everybody was like, cremation was like a shameful thing to do. Um, and it was really downplayed by, by our own, people in our own industry. But now the consumer demand is where it's at, um, that the funeral home said nothing to conform to what the consumers wanted. It is definitely an interesting uh, time to be doing this work, that is for sure. <laughs> Just looking through to make sure I didn't uh, skip over any questions. It's great to see you guys all uh, speaking uh, to each other. So um, not all of them are to me, which is fine. I like that. <laughs> um, but we'll do a last call. If anyone wants to bump their question, make sure that we uh, got you answered while we still have the guests and the peers on the line. We'll go ahead and um, <clears throat> make sure there's no lingering issues and then uh, give a couple seconds here. I know that folks have been sharing their emails and et cetera. If, if uh, some good networking connections come out of this call, that would be an awesome outcome for any of us and all of us. So feel free to share your info and your um, areas of interest. And um, if we don't have any new questions pop, I wanna thank everyone for uh, joining us tonight, for taking time out of your Busy lives and days for joining the session. Uh, please follow the Green Burial Council on social media and or subscribe to our newsletter so you can be notified when we have a future peer-to-peer -peer forum coming up. And uh, if anyone has a topic or a guest in mind that they would like to hear from in this kind of format, please don't hesitate to flag them to our attention. Thanks everyone. It's been great, great to see you all tonight. Thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. Thank you.